Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, yeah, hey everybody, thanks for for having me. And uh, before we kick things off, I just want to take a quick moment and just talk about how big of a deal Teams Nation is here and the event you're putting on. Uh, I heard that there's well over 3,000 people that are attending. That's amazing. Uh, you know, I'm looking through this morning all of the attendance on the speakers and who all is presenting. Amazing content, and it's great that you're recording this. So. Yeah, you know, definitely go back and take advantage of it. But it's great to see this community coming together. Uh, before I was a security person, I was a voice person. And so I go way back with uh, Office communication server and live communication server. And, uh, you know, it's just it's great to see this community coming together. A um, couple things here about Zero Trust before I jump into it about my presentation uh, real quick is I got I have to mention that Zero Trust at Microsoft, it's a very broad topic and it's also a big topic uh, we could spend literally all day talking about zero trust i only have about an hour with you so i'm not going to be able to touch everything i want to touch on but i'll have some resources at the end that you can leverage to go out and, and learn a little bit more about what i've been talking about and so i'll be sure to share those the second thing i want to mention about this is i'm going to talk about this in the context of microsoft teams however this applies to anything and everything else in the environment and to really do this properly, you have to consider everything else in the environment. We'll, we'll talk about that as we go through it. OK, so with that being said, let's let's jump into the presentation here. Um, yeah, I just want to take a step back for a second. I've been in my career for about 20 years, give or take. And when I first started my career, way back when, I was in an office building accessing uh, a bunch of company software and data, but I was in an office building. I was at a desktop computer. Laptops weren't really a thing yet. Um, they weren't you know, popular. And as I sat at that desktop, I was accessing a line of business app through some kind of a client server, um, you know, dummy terminal type, type app. The data was all hosted in a data center. It was behind the firewall, obviously. It was secured by that IT department for that company. Um, I was in that building. I had a badge, so it was assumed that I was supposed to be there. And you know, you fast forward as 2021, man, of times changed, and times have really changed when you think about Microsoft Teams. I mean, here we are using Teams to get job to get our job done. I mean, for me now, granted, I'm an employee at Microsoft and it's a Microsoft product. However, um, for me, I use Teams every single day. I would say probably 70 to 80 percent of my time is spent in Teams. It might as well be my operating system. And most of the time when I'm accessing Teams, it's on different devices, and I'll talk about that here in a second. But when you think about how you want to be able to access Teams, ideally, if I'm an IT professional, I want my users to access it through a managed computer, a managed endpoint of some sort. Maybe it's an iPhone or an Android phone that's enrolled into a mobile device manager. Maybe it's a uh, Windows computer that's joined to the domain, whatever, but it's managed. And I'm assuming that only my employees of the company are going to be accessing Teams. And then I'm also assuming that all of my sensitive corporate data is in Teams. And uh, that couldn't be further from the truth. When you think about today's world, it's a lot different than that. Um, Think about what we're doing right now. Teams Nation is being hosted in a Teams tenant somewhere. I'm a guest. So I actually had to sign out of my Microsoft tenant. I had to sign into the Teams Nation tenant to come present here. And all of you are joined in as guests. And so that obviously uh, complicates things a little bit when you think about how people access Teams. But the biggest things that really concern me, and this is why we're going to talk about Zero Trust, is think about those third-party apps that are in Teams and think about that sensitive corporate data. The data is in Teams. Sure, you've got chats, you've uh, private chats, you've got channel conversations, you've got data sitting in uh, storage there in Teams, which is you know really SharePoint. However, that data could also be in a third-party cloud storage provider that's in Teams, right? In Teams, you can add Google Drive or Dropbox, so your data may be stored there. Your data may be stored in a third-party app that I talked about, but you also have other people accessing that are not your employees, people you may not trust. So if I invite you as a guest to my team, I don't know you, and now I'm giving you access to my team to access all of this sensitive data. And so I don't trust you. I don't know what kind of device you're accessing from, which opens up that risk profile. Uh, I don't understand at all 
what you might be doing with that data. Are you saving it locally and that sort of thing? So my point is there's definitely some concerns that IT has when you think about using Microsoft Teams. Amazing product. It can get the job done and man, can it make you more productive. But there are some concerns when it comes to security and even compliance. And that's where zero trust comes in. So I'm just going to kind of paint the picture here for today. And when you think about zero trust in Teams, I want you to think about securing that data. That's the keys to the kingdom. That is really the crown jewels and what everybody is after is that data. And I've got a lot of stories I could share with you at some point over that, but think about where that data is stored. Is it stored in a third party app that's running inside Teams? Is it stored in Teams itself? Or is it stored in, uh, in uh, some other you know, cloud storage provider like Dropbox, but is being accessed through Teams? How do we account for that? That's where Zero Trust comes in. So zero trust, it's its kind of an industry buzzword. Uh, and if you see me looking off to the left, I'm just checking the chat window, make sure there's no questions or anything. And if you do have any questions, toss them in the, the chat window. I'll try to answer them as we go along. Um, but when you think about zero trust, it is kind of an industry buzzword. It's a, it's a marketing buzzword. And it means different things to different people. Uh, I'm not here to tell you uh, how to think about zero trust. And um, I'm not here to tell you this is what zero trust is. What I am here to tell you, though, is when you think about the Microsoft approach to zero trust and you think about how that would apply to teams, it's never trust, always verify. Uh, to quote Ronald Reagan, it's trust, but verify. <laughs> and so how do we go in there and, and make sure that everybody accessing teams, whether you're an employee or you're a guest or you're a contractor or a customer, that you're not an imposter. You're, nobody's trying to impersonate you. It's really you. And then how do we make sure that you stay within rails there within that team session? That's what we're going to be talking about here. Uh, so let's back up a second. Let's talk a little bit about zero trust and let's understand what this is. Before we talk about the definition here around zero trust, the idea is security is complex. And look, it's 2021, times have really changed. If you were to ask me five years ago, uh, what kind of threats were in the landscape? I would have given you a very different answer than what I would tell you today. And just look what happened you know, last weekend and what's happening in the news. So security is complex. And when you think about how to secure the modern environment, that's even more complex, right? It's more than just firewalls. It's more than just managing endpoints. There's a lot more to it. And so that's obviously you know, one of the things here. And then when you think about coming in and trying to secure the network, Obviously, Teams kind of applies, but it doesn't really apply because it's cloud hosted. Um, but think about all the things that are on your network that maybe a user has access to in addition to having access to Teams. And I'll, I'll come back to that point here in just a second. And then the third thing here and the fourth thing is around BYOD. Um, I mentioned a second ago that I'm accessing Teams for multiple devices. I mean, I got my, my iPhone. You guys have seen my videos. I've got my, my MacBook here. I've got a Surface Hub over here. I've got like 10 different devices that I'm constantly accessing Teams from and, and trying to get work done. And so some of those devices are corporate owned. Some of them are personal owned. And so how do you, how do you manage that risk? That's where Zero Trust comes in. And then the other biggest part to this is making sure that we have security accounted for. So when those users do get fished and when their credentials do get compromised, that we're minimizing that impact in the environment and specifically minimizing the impact with Microsoft Teams. And so that's really the idea here behind zero trust. Now, it's important to understand, speaking of those bad guys, it's important to understand that these attacks out there, no matter the attack, is extremely cheap. And here's some, some data points just to kind of bring that home for you. You could go out and buy a ransomware kit for 66 bucks out on the dark web. That's pretty cheap. Look at that, stolen passwords, less than a dollar to go out and buy a stolen password. And so my point to this is if they want in your environment and they want to get access to Teams, they're going to pay almost nothing to be able to do it. It's very cheap for them to do, which means it allows them to scale and do this across you know, multiple organizations at the same time. So just some food for thought. And when we think about zero trust, zero trust is also coming down to this assumed breach mentality. And so we have to assume that these attackers, they're already in the environment. We have to assume that they've been in there. 
they, maybe they stole somebody's password and now they've logged into their mailbox, they're reading their email, maybe they figure out that they also use Teams and so now they're starting to log in as te to Teams as them, monitoring chats and, and looking at what they're doing in Teams. We have to understand that they're already in there. And if you look at some of the breaches in recent history over the last couple of years and you go out and read the reports, some of them will tell you that the attackers were in the environment for several years and they never even were detected. I mean, that's like me coming to your house and drinking the beverages out of your fridge and sleeping on the couch and listening to all of the private conversations between you and your family. And then when you talk about buying a new home or you talk about making some kind of big financial uh, you know, decision in your life, that's when I perk up and I take action. That's exactly what's happening here. And so as you'll see when I talk about zero trust, it's about putting barriers in place to minimize that. Okay, so zero trust for Microsoft Teams. What does that look like? I threw this graphic in here to give you an idea of how to, how to think about zero trust with Teams. Now, again, this could be applied to many other applications in the environment, not just Teams, but hey, this is Teams Nation. We're here to talk about Teams. So let me walk you through it a little bit, and then we're gonna break this down in detail as we go throughout the session. Over on the far left side, you'll see user identity. Identity is the foundation to zero trust for us at Microsoft. And so when we think about identity, it's more than just your user account. It's what security groups are you a part of? What role do you have? Are you an admin? What kind of admin role do you have? So on and so forth. And then it's also about your location. So where are you logging in from? GeoIP, which matters and doesn't matter, but I'll, I'll get to that here in a few minutes. And then also, what kind of privileges do you have? So if I'm an administrator, and I'm signing into you know, an app, a line of business application, um, do I need full admin access or can I get by with just standard user access? And I'll, again, I'll come back to that and why that matters here in a segment of Teams. Session risk. So this is interesting. So when I go to sign into Microsoft Teams, if I'm coming from a uh, known botnet IP address or some kind of an anonymous IP address, or if there's some kind of a, a uh, 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 impossible travel scenario where I'm logging in from San Diego where I live and the next minute I'm logging in from New York and I can't get there in under a minute, that might be a factor here. When you think about user risk, think about the user's account themselves. Are the credentials up for sale on the dark web? Is that user exhibiting behavior that perhaps they might be compromised? And those are all signals that are coming in through Azure Active Directory, but then also through Microsoft 365 Defender. We'll, we'll talk about that uh, coming up here and how that works. So that's coming in to the Zero Trust Engine. The next part is around devices. And so this is interesting. When you think about a user signing in, they could sign in from any device um, if you don't configure in this policy. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? I'll let you be the judge on that. But when you go to sign in from a device, we're going to look to see, is that device managed? Is it managed? Is it joined to Active Directory? on premises? Is it joined to Azure Active Directory? Is it managed by a mobile device management solution, maybe AirWatch or Microsoft Endpoint Manager? Is it trusted? Now, if it's trusted, then what's the next step? Well, what's the compliance status look like on it? And we'll, we'll get into that here in a second. What's the risk level of that device? Are there any active threats? And I'll talk about that coming up. Hey, what type of device is it? Is it an iPad versus a Windows machine versus a Mac? Is it managed or unmanaged? I might want to offer up different experiences based on the type of device and the version of OS. That's another important point. Uh, you know, being a being an iPhone user, uh, there's probably been what two or three software updates that have come come out in the last you know month or two that are security hotfixes. Uh, that might be part of my requirements here to say, look, I don't want you accessing Teams on your iPhone unless the ver the OS version is up to date and actually patched. That could be part of it. Uh, and then encryption status is the device encrypted as well. well. We'll get into all that here in a second. Uh, that's all doable through Microsoft Defender for Endpoint and then Microsoft Endpoint Manager, of course. And then we can also tie in with third-party MDMs. On the other side of this is Microsoft Information Protection. Don't worry about that yet. We'll jump into it. And then Microsoft Cloud App Security. That helps me to provide some additional things for Teams. And it's not just around Teams, but I'm also concerned about those apps running on Teams. So if you're accessing... Um, you know, DocuSign or some kind of an app running in Teams, I want to make sure that we're securing that experience as well. Because again, data could spill over to that. You could have data coming from that app back into Teams. You want to make sure you're managing that. Now, down at the bottom, you'll see Sentinel. 
Uh, I believe there's a session here at Teams Nation for Teams and Sentinel. So you're going to want to check that out. I'm not going to go too deep into that today. Uh, but what Sentinel is going to do is bring together all the signals from all of this into a single dashboard. And you can build some interesting reports and you can pull some data insights from it in addition to getting alerts and, and building uh, investigation incidents and that kind of thing. But the zero trust solution for Microsoft Teams looks like this. Now, all of those uh, factors are being fed into this middle circle here, security compliance policy engine. It's really Azure Active Directory, and I'll, I'll talk about that coming up. Okay, so let's keep going here, and let's start digging into identity a little bit. I mentioned that's the foundation for all of this. So where do you start? Well, we have to start with how do you access Teams? Are you signing into Teams with a different credential than when you use to sign in with your you know, standard work computer? I have met customers that have done that. I have met customers that are using a separate username and password for Windows Server Active Directory, thus their workstation is signing into that domain. That's a separate credential. And then I've met customers that are also sign into Office 365 and Teams using a completely separate username and password. Look, that's debatable whether or not that's secure. The problem with that is because the user has to now remember two passwords, they're probably going to write it down. So it's probably not going to be that secure. And then when you go to uh, hire people and fire people, how are you provisioning and deprovisioning their access? And so if I were to paint it done for you and, and show you what a complete picture would look like for this, starting that HR system, when you provision that employee's account and provision their, their kind of profile as an employee, that would flow into either Windows Server Active Directory or Azure Active Directory. And through the beauty of Azure AD Connect, we will synchronize that up to Azure AD. And then from there, we'll provision single sign-on onto Microsoft Teams. That's ideal. And I'll talk about why you want to do that here in a second. But the other part of this is think about those Teams apps. All right, think about those apps that are running inside Teams. When I go to add it to Teams, it, it requires me to sign in with credentials for that app, right? Well, when I go to sign into that app, I want to make sure that I'm using the same Azure Active Directory credentials that I am for Teams and Office 365, maybe even my workstation. I'm using those same credentials also for those third-party SaaS apps. And that's going to allow me to have a, a security blanket wrapped around those apps and around Teams. That's really step one, is provisioning single sign-on for not only Teams, but really those apps running in Teams. I'm just checking a chat window here. Okay, yeah, good point about the keynotes. Yeah, and please feel free to toss questions in the IM window. So that's really step one. Um, I can't help you with zero trust unless we get single sign-on set up for those SaaS apps and running on Teams and Microsoft Teams itself and making sure that all of this plumbing is in place, best practices are being met, so on and so forth. And there's reasons why you want to do this. One of the reasons is so you can employ strong authentication. You know, it's kind of interesting. Microsoft published a blog. It might have been almost two years now. Maybe some of you might remember. Toss it in the chat window if you do. But we published a blog. Uh, one of our vice presidents of identity, a guy named Alex, he published a blog about if you look at all of the identity-based attacks out there that have been in the news and you read the reports, 99.9% of them could have been stopped if multi-factor authentication was deployed. Now, that's pretty incredible. And in my personal life, I'm sure a lot of you do as well, when I use my bank, I'm using multi-factor authentication. When I access uh, social media, I've got multi-factor authentication set up. So my personal life, I'm, I'm doing the best I can to secure it. Why not let my work life follow? So when I go to access my corporate data for my job, I should absolutely be accessing that with strong authentication, multi-factor authentication. And when you think about the data that's being stored in Teams, just take a step back with me for a second. You know, when Teams first launched, even when it was in public preview, what was it, back in 2017, 2018, where we had chats going, we had channel conversations, but as Teams grew and grew and grew, people started realizing this is the operating system for my work life. I'm gonna store data here. I'm gonna put all of our files in here. We're gonna collaborate on it. We're gonna co-author, it's gonna be great. All of our chats are happening here. All of our meetings are happening here. So any attachment for the meeting is being uploaded to Teams. All of a sudden now Teams because it becomes this mission critical app that's storing a bunch of sensitive data. You need to make sure you secure access to it. A username and password is not going to cut it. And I could talk all, all day long about why passwords are bad. But when you think about strong authentication, I want you to picture what's on this slide. 
So when I go to access Teams and really any other app in the environment, I should be using MFA. Now, what is MFA? It could be a push notification on the Authenticator app on your mobile phone. Sure, uh, that, that's certainly part of it. I could use a soft token, one-time passcode, where on that Authenticator app on my smartphone, I, I punch uh, my identity and it gives me a six-digit passcode that expires every you know, 60 seconds or th every 30 seconds. Sure, I might be able to use a hardware token. Uh, I had a job at one point at a different company where I had an RSA token. That was way back in the day. Uh, sure, those are supported as well. SMS and voice. Is SMS secure? I mean, it's kind of debatable. Could it be spoofed and hacked? Yes. Uh, but voice is interesting. If I call you from the automated system, you actually have to type in a passcode in order to authenticate. So those are all different types of MFA. You know, I would go for the push notification because it's the easiest. Um, but there's also adoption and change management you have to worry about. But when you think about going passwordless, this is a whole other factor to this. Um, now, granted, I'm, again, I'm a Microsoft employee. I'm using Microsoft technology. I'm sure a lot of you are using Microsoft technology too. But you know, when I log in every day from my workstation, uh, I've got a FIDO2 security key. In fact, uh, here it is. It's a little, it's a little UB key. Uh, it might be hard to see there in the camera. It's kind of blurry, but it's a little USB key that has my identity on it. And so when I plug this into my computer in the morning, it's going to ask me for a passcode. I type in the passcode, and with the certificates and everything on that key, it authenticates me. That's two-factor, something I have, or something I know, rather, and then something I have. That's what I do. Now, I also have the choice of using Windows Hello. This is pretty awesome. Uh, most modern computers, I'm going to say most, most modern laptops, that is, will have either uh, a fingerprint reader or they'll have some kind of a Windows Hello camera uh, built in. And you could buy third-party cameras and biometrics on the market as well. But when you enroll into Windows Hello, it's basically kind of like this YubiKey. It's taken a certificate. It stores it on a, on a uh, trusted protection module chip that we call it uh, on the motherboard. And then it also uses your face or your fingerprint to authenticate you. So that's multi-factor authentication. And I'll talk about why Windows Hello is awesome here in a second. But obviously there's Microsoft Authenticator app and there's some other things. But by going passwordless, there's no password to remember. And that's, that was really my point to that rant. And so when I think about how I use this every day, I've got my, my little YubiKey. Now I have my own uh, eight digit passcode to unlock the YubiKey that I use. That's optional, you don't have to have it. I just, I'm a security guy. But when I go to sign in, I don't have to know my password, which means there's no password to fish. So if you send me a phishing email and you're expecting me to type my password into some kind of a web form because you want to steal it, there's no password. So when you think about going passwordless, there's benefits there. And again, taking this back to Teams, how you access Teams really matters because of the sensitive data that's being stored in it. So when you think, if you're a consultant watching this uh, and you're from a Microsoft partner, think about how do you help your clients be successful with that? Obviously, it's a journey. If you're a customer watching this, uh, how do you pilot this in the environment to make sure that you, know, you, you, uh, you do what's needed and meet the certain requirements that you have to be able to roll it out? It's a journey, right? But you have to start and there's many different options here to start with MFA. Uh, I'm looking at the, the chat window here. How many banks still only offer short pin or SMSs or only MFA? Yeah, far too many. I totally agree, Richard. Um, you know, my, <laughs> luckily my bank offers um, offers MFA through a one-time passcode. They have, a, they have an app that you install, um, but there's some other places that I've worked with that it's just SMS. And there's a lot of places that don't even have MFA. Uh, so, it's the world's coming around, but we still have a long ways to go. Um, okay, so why does all this matter? Well, single sign on is a big deal. If I'm using something like Windows Hello and I sign it with my face every day on my Surface or my Dell laptop or HP or whatever I'm running, and I sign it with my face or my fingerprint, I'm not typing a password. So obviously that's nice, right? It just logs me right in. And then once I get logged into Windows, I can launch Teams and I will never get prompted for a password. I can launch my line of business app as long as the plumbing is in place and I never get prompted for a password. That's the beauty of single sign-on through Azure Active Directory. Or if I'm using my YubiKey, I authenticate using this. Once I'm in Windows, I never ever get prompted for using a password, ever. Because single sign-on is kicking in for all those applications. Teams is no different. Now think about these apps that are running in Teams. Here I have a little screenshot of the apps. Well, if I go through and I configure single sign-on for, for Jira, or Zoho, or Workstreams.ai, or even uh, Service Desk here, or any of these apps, Poly, whatever it may be, 
if I set up single sign-on, when I sign into my Windows device through Windows Hello, or hey, it could be a Mac as well, you can those support YubiKeys. When I sign in using that strong authentication, if single sign-on is set up appropriately, then when I launch Teams, I will not get prompted for a password. And then when I launch these different apps and I go to use them, I won't be asked to sign in either. That's obviously a huge benefit. And when it comes to auditing and, and monitoring all of this, if I'm using single sign-on, that lights up a whole new set of reports on the back end for me to be able to monitor and audit activity. So if I can see what you're doing in these apps and what you're doing in Teams, obviously that's ideal to be able to monitor for security and compliance. Okay. The next step with this, going down this identity path, is around something called Azure Active Directory Identity Protection. Uh, and I, I misspelled directory. Look at that, I left off the Y. Uh, um, my fault. So Azure Active Directory Identity Protection is pretty interesting. It's part of Azure AD Premium Plan 2, or EMS E5, or Microsoft 365 E5, or Security E5. Uh, pick your license. But when you think about how this works and how it pairs with Teams, when I go to log into Teams, it's going to look to see is Matt Sosman's credentials leaked on the public internet? Are they up for sale on the dark web? Are they you know, somewhere that they shouldn't be? That's obviously a risk factor. Is Matt signing in from an IP address that's anonymous? Um, now, here in the US, it's, it's not normal for an end user to sign in from an anonymous IP address. However, in other countries, it might be using an anonymous VPN client or even a Tor browser. So that might have to be adjusted depending on your, your circumstance, but it's going to check to see are you coming from an anonymous IP address. And possible travel. That's another great one. So again, if I'm in San Diego one minute and I log in from New York City the next minute, I can't possibly travel in that amount of time to New York. So that's an impossible travel scenario. So obviously that's a risk factor. What's the device look like that he's signing in from? Um, is it part of a known botnet? as an example. Is the IP address that he's signing in from, is it associated with suspicious activity? And there's a lot more to this conversation I could share about how that works, but we'll, we'll save that for another session. But again, we're looking for these different risk factors. And then one of my favorites here is, this is building a profile on every user in the environment. And so it's monitoring to see where they log in from normally. So hey, I live in San Diego and uh, fortunately or unfortunately, because of the pandemic, I haven't traveled anywhere in the last year other than just around town. So if I all of a sudden log in from Los Angeles, or even if I go up to Redmond and I log in from Redmond, I because I don't normally log in from those locations, it's going to show up as a risk factor because it's unfamiliar for Matt. So all of these factors come together to help make a decision on whether or not we're going to allow you to access Teams. And I'll talk about how that comes together here as we as we go along. Okay, so that's identity. We could talk a lot more about it, but let's move into devices here. This, this is probably one of the best, best parts about Zero Trust, in my opinion, is if you're, if you're coming from a device, let's make sure the device is healthy, compliant, secure, free of threats, managed, trusted. So the idea here with the Zero Trust approach for Teams is we want to make sure you're coming from a device that's trusted, that's managed, that is healthy. We want to make sure that we have access to the telemetry from that device to understand and have visibility into its health and compliance. Um, I'll come back to this one around vulnerable and compromised endpoints in a second, but we also want to be able to enforce policies. So if you're coming from a device that's maybe unhealthy and you're trying to log into Teams, well, rather than blocking you, we might want to give you an opportunity to say, hey, Go ahead and update Windows Update or uh, update whatever wh whatever is out of compliance here. Here's an opportunity to update that policy. And if you're using Microsoft Endpoint Manager and it's on, say, Windows or, or you know, any other device, we can actually enforce that policy in real time to bring you up to speed so you will be compliant and let you through to access Teams. I'll talk about that here in just a second. But this is around the device portion of being able to access Teams through Zero Trust. So let's kill back the onion on this and let's look at what this actually means. Getting visibility into that endpoint is extremely important. So look, if you're trying to access Microsoft Teams and your device has malicious applications on it, malware or ransomware, obviously that's a problem, right? 
And so if it goes to access teams and that malware somehow can read data into teams because now I'm logged in, that's obviously a really bad day. And so I want to be able to, uh, as you authenticate into teams, I want to be able to do a quick threat check and see, are there any active threats on the environment or on the endpoint? And I can do that threat check through a number of different methods. Uh, the first method is through Microsoft Defender for Endpoint. Uh, that is basically available on iOS, Android, Mac OS, Windows 10, Linux, Windows Server. But it's doing a threat check at the time of authentication into Teams to see, is that device healthy? Is there any risk with that device? Now, if I'm coming from some other types of devices, there are some industry partners out there uh, that we work with that can also supply that same capability as Defender for Endpoint. So it's, you know, we'll, we'll meet you where you're at. So if you're running something like Zimporium, it's Imperium rather, um, or you're running Checkpoint, then obviously that can integrate here into Microsoft Endpoint Manager to provide that, that threat check. But that's one part of it. The second part is device manipulation. A uh, great example of this is, hey, if, you're, if your iOS or Android phone has been, has been rooted or jailbroken, um, that's obviously gonna be a risk factor. And so do we wanna allow you access to Teams? Yes or no? Uh, network exploits, uh, I'm not gonna get into. Data privacy, privacy violations, I'm not gonna get into, but device health. Let's talk about that for a second. So I mentioned um, patching and updates. So if my iPhone or my Windows machine or my MacBook is missing the latest update, then we'll block access to Teams. If my device doesn't have specific um, features enabled, like maybe antivirus is turned off or the firewall feature is turned off or disk encryption is turned off, then you're not gonna be compliant. We're not gonna allow you access to Teams. I talked about OS version before, uh, email profile, I'm not gonna get into because that's, that's kind of out of scope here for Teams. But there's all these different signals that Microsoft Endpoint Manager is gonna look at to decide whether or not you're gonna be accessing Teams. And this is all part of zero trust. And so bringing this back, if you think about how, uh, how myself as a Microsoft employee, how I access uh, my line of business apps, including Teams, I have to be on a device that is managed and trusted and that device must be compliant with all of these different things in order for me to access Teams just in my day job. And so again, thinking about Teams and how important it is to the business and how much data is sensitive that's being stored in Teams, you probably want to understand what device they're coming from and put blocks in place if it's on a device that is not healthy and not compliant and maybe not trusted. Now I'll leave that up to you on how you, on how you want to do that in your environment, um, but that is a consideration here when you think about zero trust. Uh, here's kind of a generic slide. Uh, I'll explain what's happening here, but let's pretend for a moment that, whoops, let me back up. Let's pretend for a moment that a user somehow gets malware installed on their device. Maybe they open up a attachment from their personal email and that installs malware. You know, maybe they insert a, uh, you know, a USB stick and that installs malware in the device. Regardless, there's ransomware or malware or some kind of threat active on the device. Well, Microsoft Defender for Endpoint will actually see that, and it's gonna write to the Microsoft Security Graph saying, hey, this device has a risk associated with it. And at that point, conditional access kicks in and it denies access. Now it denies access until Defender for Endpoint can go through and clean that malware. And then it will allow you to have access to Teams or Office 365 or whatever the app is. And so that's just a very, basic example of, of how this, this device threat uh, uh, thing comes together. It's basically using Microsoft Defender for Endpoint. And, and I wish I had all day with you because there's so much more I want to tell you about this. Um, but again, it's, it's key because if I'm accessing Teams from a device that has malware or ransomware on it, that could obviously not be ideal. So we want to make sure we're protecting that device. And this is cool because it will actually block access to Teams. It will block access to everything if you wanted to. So if I try to launch my email or I try to launch Teams or I go into OneDrive or heck, if I pull up Dropbox, it will actually block all of those applications because there's some kind of an active threat on that device. And that's just through the intelligence here of, of zero trust. Uh, here's, here's a slide that kind of shows you a little bit about that. So um, again, if there's an active threat, it's going to understand that. It's going to write it back to our graph. And then for all those different apps I try to access, it's going to restrict the access. And then once Defender for Endpoint goes through and cleans those devices, then it will restore access 
and uh, life will be back to normal. And that's all automatic. So again, when we think about teams, that's really important. Check the chat window. I don't see any questions. So we'll we'll keep moving forward here. Okay. One of my favorite topics when it comes to mobile devices, iPhones, Android phones, iPads, Android tablets, it's something called mobile application management, MAM. Uh, now, if you go into the product, Microsoft Employee Manager, you will see it referred to as app protection policies as well. This is really awesome. So let's pretend for a moment I have a personal phone. And maybe for privacy reasons, I do not want my company to manage this device. I'm not going to enroll it, all right? I just don't want them to see what, what I'm doing on that device. It's personal. That's okay, because if I want to install the Teams app on that device, we can manage the Teams app and only the Teams app. The rest of the, the data on that device, we cannot touch. We can't touch any of the other apps. It's just that Teams app. And that's through this app protection policy capability. So when I go to access Teams, there's all sorts of different things I can do here. So for example, when I go to access Teams on that personal device, I can require a passcode. Hey, it's a personal device. Your kids might pick it up. It might get lost or stolen. So I'm gonna set a passcode or a pin for you to access the Teams app. And you can set timeout values and you, there's all sorts of configuration you could do here. Uh, I may also have a, a policy that says, if you try to copy data out of the Teams app, maybe from a channel conversation or a private chat, or even a document you're, you're reading in the Teams document viewer, I could block that copy and paste. So here's an example of me trying to copy data out of Teams and paste it into the, uh, the Notes app here on an iPhone. That's get, that gets blocked. Uh, and then if I try to open some kind of a file in Teams, and maybe I want to save it locally on that device, hey, it's a personal device. So when I try to save it locally, that policy gets enforced and you can't. There's no option to save it anywhere. So that's a couple of examples of, of how we can do this. But here's some other examples. And this is not exhaustive. I just you know, threw a few in here. But I want to call out a couple of my favorites. And something I would like for you to think about when users go to access Teams on a mobile device. The third party keyboards could be a, a risk factor. Uh, there have been a lot of uh, industry publications out there about how these third party keyboards will actually send data back to the, the OEM of that keyboard, the vendor. And sometimes that vendor's data center is somewhere that maybe doesn't adhere to your industry regulations. Um, it's sending everything that you type back to that vendor. And so there obviously could be a huge privacy problem there. So we could block those third party keyboards right in Teams. Uh, being able to do things like require data encryption on Teams. And then probably my absolute favorite one is the selective wipe. So, hey, I have a personal device. I install Teams on it. I'm using Teams. Great. I leave the company. Well, you can issue a selective wipe command to just the app, just the Teams app, and it will wipe the data in the Teams app. So the next time I go to access Teams, I just get a, uh, a standard login page because all the data has been wiped. And I don't touch the device at all because it's still a personal device. So just some things uh, I'd like for you to think about here and, and how your users access Teams on their mobile devices. And when it comes to zero trust, you want to make sure that you not only secure the environment, but you also empower them. And that's the beauty here because I actually have, this is a great story. I had one customer, they just did not want to roll out Teams on their mobile devices because everybody had personal devices. They did not use MDM, uh, mobile device management. And they just said, look, people are not going to use Teams on their personal device. Well, I know everybody on here are Teams fans, just like myself. And if I don't have Teams on my phone, I don't know how to live my life. And I'm sure you are the same way. And so being able to have access to it can make you way more productive and make you empowered. And so that customer, we talked to him about app protection policies here around Teams. We piloted this and make a long story short, they ended up rolling out Teams for personal devices by employing some policies here. So you never know what can happen, but check it out in your environment. Mobile compliance. This is another part of it. So let's say you're going to access Teams on a mobile device. Well, I need to make sure that device is compliant, right? We talked about this before. And so what does the OS build of that device look like? Is it jailbroken or rooted? Is there a passcode set on the device itself? Um, are there any apps on that device that maybe you don't want installed? 
So there's all sorts of compliance uh, requirements I could put in so that when you try to launch Teams, if these compliance requirements are not met, you cannot launch Teams. Again, it's your, it's your app, it's your data in Teams. You wanna make sure that it's well protected and being able to enforce this is part of that zero trust program and strategy. Um, I've met a lot of organizations over the, the years here where by employing zero trust, not only are they create a technical policy behind it, but they're also creating the people process behind it. So they're creating a, a, a page in the employee handbook. Uh, their legal department is drafting up you know, an official company policy for it, so on and so forth. So that when you're a new hire at that organization and you want to get access to teams on your personal device, well, hey, here's the requirements you have to meet to be able to do that. And again, through zero trust policy, we can enforce those requirements. Okay, uh, let's get into apps a little bit and what that means. And this is specifically the Teams app, but also those third-party apps that run inside Teams. A uh, couple things here I want to I want to talk about. The first one is being able to discover those third-party apps and Teams, how they're being used. And then from there, assess whether or not you want to allow people, those users, to use those apps and teams or block them. Now, you're, you're telling me, well, Matt, I can just go into the Teams admin console and block all third-party apps. Yeah, you can, and that's the easy button, right? But you might have a bad day doing that because your end users, they want to be empowered. They want to be productive. They want to have access to these third-party apps. And I don't blame them because there's some amazing apps that can really help you in your day job. So I'll talk about how you do this here in a second, but this is the ability to go out and actually look in the environment, see what of those, which of those apps are actually in use, and then make some intelligent decisions around, should we allow them to be used or should we block them? So that's certainly a part of it. And then assessing the risk levels of those apps. Hey, where are those apps hosted? Where's the data hosted? Does it comply with GDPR? Does it comply with CCPA? Does it comply with HIPAA? Uh, what's the security posture of those apps? Do they support single sign-on, so on and so forth? That could be your secret weapon into protecting your Teams environment. Because once you run one of those third-party apps in Teams and data starts spilling over, it's game over. So we want to make sure we secure that. And that starts with understanding what apps are in use. Now, once we understand what apps are in use, well, now let's have a conversation about should we extend some policy enforcement into that app? So here's a great example. This is where I can go through and maybe I go to log into um, Dropbox via Teams. Well, I can put in policy that says, okay, if you're using Teams on a personal device, maybe I let you have access to the web browser uh, view of Teams. But when you go to download a file, we block the download. You can only view online. Maybe we block printing. Maybe we block a copy paste. Maybe we block uh, your ability to edit. There's all sorts of things we could do there. In Dropbox, running in Teams. And so that's kind of the next step here to zero trust is when I think about how I need to allow my users to, to actually use Teams and use these other apps, the answer isn't always, let's just block it completely. The answer sometimes needs to be, we have to allow it, but let's put rails on it and let's, let's enforce some policy here so we could still be somewhat secure and still be able to meet our requirements. Uh, just a short story, I had a customer of mine, this was probably, probably about a year ago, I wanna say. It was, it was pre-pandemic. Um, they had, no joke, they had 3,000 contractors accessing Teams and other apps, but mostly Teams. 3,000 contractors. And those contractors were coming from personal devices, devices managed by their company. And so this customer, they couldn't give those contractors managed devices. That's too expensive and that doesn't make any sense. So we started looking at all of the requirements here and we started thinking about how do we do this and that's where we started to employ Microsoft Cloud App Security and session control to be able to control Teams and that web browser session for those contractors. Now, uh, I think there's a couple sessions here at Teams Nation about this. So if you get a chance to watch those, uh, they'll talk a little bit deeper about it. But here's a screenshot of what that looks like. So for those contractors, the policy was you had to use the web browser version of Teams to sign in. And when you sign in, we're gonna block your ability to download files because you're on a non-managed device. And we don't want our data to be, uh, to be you know, on that non-managed device. 
Uh, that was their policy. But notice you can do other things here too. You can block copy and paste. You can block printing. Um, I can even block uh, instant messages. So when you go to actually send an IM, and here's a good example, when you go to send an IM with something that's maybe sensitive, we can actually see that from a session perspective and just block it before it even goes on the wire. So there's some interesting scenarios there. Uh, I'll address questions here in just a second. Uh, so when you think about th that data and you think about how you access that data inside Teams, obviously it's really important. But you also want to consider what kind of data do we have in Teams? What is being stored? How is it being stored? And that is where I think about using tools like Microsoft Information Protection and being able to classify and label and encrypt that data. So if that data is sitting inside Teams and it's you know, sitting as a file in, in SharePoint Online, but it's being surfaced through Teams, or maybe the file is sitting in Dropbox, but it's being surfaced through, through Teams, I want to go out there and do a discovery. I want to understand what data contains credit card numbers, what data contains PII, what data contains my intellectual property. You know, I want to go out there and discover all that data across those cloud storage uh, uh, apps, but also across Teams, and then put a label on it. Hey, this piece of data over here is highly confidential. This piece of data over here is more public access. That's okay. This data over here is maybe sensitive. And those labels that sit on those files can actually encrypt the file. So go back to my contractor example. When those contractors, if we just allow them to download the files, and if they used Microsoft Information Protection, they could download the files from Teams, but they're encrypted. They become useless unless you have the right identity and you have the right permissions to access it. That's Microsoft Information Protection, and specifically sensitivity labels in Microsoft 365. But again, that's important for Teams, because as we start to store more and more sensitive data in Teams, we want to make sure that we're protecting that data. OK, uh, let me go to the chat window for just a moment here. Let's check questions. Uh, Richard asks, is there any new compliance baseline that can be brought in gradually? Example, warning for some days, weeks before enforcement, so a key person doesn't suddenly lose access. Richard, yes. Um, when, you, when I talked about compliance before, in Microsoft Endpoint Manager, when I go to create a compliance policy, I can give a grace period. And so that's that's absolutely doable. Uh, so uh, no worries there. And I would absolutely recommend doing that. I mean, this is definitely a journey. Um, you want to make sure that you ease into it. Um, so another question here, is it possible to prevent a user from uploading files to from a company-owned managed Windows 10 device to other tenants where their guests or participants? Uh, OK. So the short answer is no. The long answer is yes. <laughs> so if I'm on a, well, let's, let's, take, let's take Microsoft, for example. I'm on a Microsoft computer right now, asset. If I log into Teams Nation and this, the Teams Nation tenant, and I try to upload a file, which actually, funny enough, the paperclip is grayed out for me here in the, in the Teams meeting. So I'm not even allowed to upload files, apparently, due to the policy. But let's say I was, and I try to upload a file from my computer, from the Microsoft asset. There's something called Endpoint DLP. It's part of Microsoft Information Protection. Endpoint DLP can actually see that behavior. And because that is a non-approved tenant, it will actually stop you from uploading it. That's one example. Second example is going back to what I showed here on the slide. If I have my data labeled and encrypted, if I do go to upload it, it's encrypted. It, it really is unusable. So that's kind of shifting the mindset a little bit from, I don't want to just prevent data from leaving. I'm going to allow data to leave because that's what users want. And that's the reality. They're going to share it wherever they want. But I'm going to encrypt it no matter where it goes. And that, that travels in the metadata of that file. And as you open the file, it, it phones home to Azure and it checks policy. And there's a lot more to talk about that, but that would be my second method of doing it. First method is endpoint DLP. Third method is if you want to go down that DLP route, obviously Office 365 DLP as well. Um, but really endpoint DLP will stop me from uploading from that from that managed device to something that's maybe non-managed. So, so great question. Uh, okay, have a few more things to talk about before we wrap up. As you can see, there's there's so much to talk about. Um, when you think about those apps that run inside Teams, and you think about the apps that 
a product like Microsoft Cloud App Security can help protect here. Uh, I want you to think about obviously teams, but think about Salesforce. If you're running Salesforce inside teams, we need to make sure that we have a little level of protection on it. Single sign on is set up. We're, we're searching for data across Salesforce. We're encrypting that data. We're using policy to prevent data from Salesforce from being downloaded or leaked. Same thing with Box, same thing with G Suite Those and Dropbox. Those three run inside Teams. Uh, you can even access uh, uh, WebEx and DocuSign and Jira inside Teams and Zendesk. And I think even Adobe and Zoom have connectors there. So think about how to use Microsoft Cloud App Security to protect these apps that run inside Teams and that will help you fill out that zero trust journey. And I know there's some sessions here at Teams Nation about MCAS and using it to protect teams. So you're definitely gonna to wanna to check that out. Okay, protecting sensitive data. I've already kind of talked about this. Uh, so I'm gonna skip over that. Um, I'm gonna skip over this slide. I'll, I'll give you all access to these slides. So you can download it later. What I do wanna land on is this. And so when you approach the data side of this, you do want to kind of understand what is it that you're dealing with. And chances are there's going to be different types of data where you're going to have different types of policy. And so you want to make sure you understand that. So some data you might encrypt. So some data that's in Teams, you might want to encrypt it. Other data you might not want to because it has to travel inside and outside. Uh, you may want to block sharing of that data. You may want to block upload and download of that data, especially download. Uh, I'm actually seeing a lot of customers starting to employ policies to block uploads if there's malware. So if you're trying to upload some kind of a malicious file to Teams, through policy, I can block that upload. Uh, one of my favorites here is adding visual markings. Uh, I once met a customer, uh, this was a couple of years ago actually, they didn't encrypt these files that they stored in Teams. All they did was they applied visual markings. Just think of like a watermark, confidential, draft, top secret, whatever it may be, just to remind the user that, hey, this document is sensitive, but they didn't necessarily have any encryption policy on it. That was just how they want to do things. Uh, and then most importantly is control access. Um, I'm not going to go into uh, all of the new controls around channels and how you can do private channels and permissions, but that's definitely a consideration. But I'm not as much worried about that as I am about the data itself. Think about that file. How do I control access to that Word document living in Teams or living in Dropbox that's running through Teams? That's really what you want to be concerned about. And that's where products like Microsoft Information Protection come into play. And so this is an example of that. This is where I have an Excel spreadsheet. This spreadsheet is stored in Teams. And through this policy, I can go out and discover that the spreadsheet has some sensitive data in it. In this case, it's got some credit card numbers. We automatically applied a label of confidential to it, which means it's now encrypted. And because it's encrypted and because it's now labeled, when I, that user goes to share it outside of Teams or they go to download it or they go to do something with it, my policy could just block it altogether. Or it could allow, depending on my requirements. But again, understanding your data and deploying that policy is the first step. You can even put this in read-only mode uh, and audit-only mode as well. Okay, check in the chat window, no questions. So let's bring it all together. Now there's a session at Teams Nation here uh, where they go deeper into conditional access, but conditional access, it's part of Azure Active Directory. It's really the heart and soul of the zero trust approach here and everything I've been talking about. So you wanna stitch all of this together. I've been talking about identity. I told you a lot about how to think about identity with this in, in Microsoft Teams. We talked about devices and making sure that they're free of threats and making sure that they're trusted and compliant and have all the right policy on it. We talked about locations a little bit. Uh, not really appropriate for Teams here, so I'm not going to get into client apps and auth method, uh, although that is applicable for other things. We talked about risk. So what's happening here in the middle? So as I go to sign into Teams, for maybe a trusted and compliant device and with my identity, well, it's gonna check to see, hey, are you you know, logging in from a known botnet? Are you logging in with leaked credentials? Are you logging in from an infected device? It will give me a risk score. And then from there, I have a set of controls that I can employ to say, allow Matt access to Teams, don't allow him access to Teams, or maybe limit his access to Teams. And not just to Teams, but all those apps that are running inside Teams. 
uh, you know, it'd be pretty awesome if, if any of you want to count how many te- how many times Teams was said throughout every session uh, today. Uh, I bet it was a lot. So this is how you stitch together with conditional access. And again, this makes up the entire zero trust picture here. Okay. So where do you go from here? Again, I could spend all day about this. There's so much to talk about. What I want you to do is just take a screenshot of this, write it down, put it in your OneNote, aka.ms slash zero trust. When you go to that website, there's a lot of information here about how to build out a zero trust business plan, do an assessment on your own environment, all the resources you need to deploy these things I've been talking about, and also help you understand, are you ready for zero trust? So it's a great, Website's a great resource. Um, This is not done overnight. This is definitely a journey. For me, where I would start is just start with identity. Do we have multi-factor authentication deployed? Do we have identity protection deployed? If we're still running um, Windows Server Active Directory, do we have Defender for Identity monitoring Windows Server Active Directory for threats? Because those threats could come over to Teams. Um, Are we using Azure Active Directory Connect to sync between Azure AD and on-prem AD? Is that optimized? Single sign-on, we talked about single sign-on. So I would start with identity and let that be your starting point and then ease into device management we talked about and session controls with MCAS and protecting your data with Microsoft Information Protection. And the reason why is all of those products require a strong identity foundation in order to be able to, to deploy them and be successful. Okay. Uh, I, wow, we have five minutes left. Um, so hopefully you got some value out of this and you got inspired here a little bit around are the possible. A um, couple things I want you to walk away with is obviously that website. I also want you to go out and, and rate this. Um, I enjoy doing these uh, for the community. And you know, as you can see with my, I'm very enthusiastic. I, I really enjoy this. So I do want to hear your feedback. If there's something I missed in the presentation, let me know. If there's something I could do better for next time, let me know so we can do better for next time. But just give me a rating and and please just go ahead and uh, give me some feedback. Also, let the Teams Nation organizers know, their, know your feedback as well here. And, and not only with my session, but hey, how the day is going. The last thing I'll mention, and I'm going to let you all drop, is uh, keep up the good work. Keep up going out there and deploying teams in your environments, managing teams, but also keep up the good work around security. It's really hard to get anything done unless it's secure and compliant. And so just keep that in the back of your mind. And by all means, if you have questions, if you have issues, there's a wealth of information out there and there's all sorts of people here on this call that can help you through it. Okay, everybody, uh, this is the last um, uh, time I'm gonna be doing this for Teams Nation. So uh, we'll see y'all in the next year. The next time this comes around, this is my last and only session. Um, Oh, I see a question just came in. Okay, one minute here. Question, do you know if we'll ever get conditional access policies to require require app protection policies on Windows and not just iOS and Android? Do I know if that's ever gonna happen? Um, I don't know. Um, There are ways to to not get around it, but there are some alternatives there. Um, WIP is now endpoint DLP, so WIP is kind of no more. So just some things to think about there. Um, but hey, if you want to reach out to me on LinkedIn and 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 uh, ask some more questions, you know, feel free to do so. All right, 9:58 here on the West Coast, um, wherever you may be. Have a good afternoon. Have a good evening. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Stay safe. We'll see you later.